All right. I have the immense privilege of speaking with Ali Ward, who happened to be the very first person to ask me to be on her brand new podcast. I think it's the first time that I was ever on a podcast uh, as the first guest, and it happened to be with Allie and her show, Ologies. So to me, this is pretty cool. Uh, and and I wanted to give you a little intro, Allie, and then kind of turn the question around. So I know that you're the host of Ologies, which is fantastic. <laughs> Check it out if you haven't, listeners. Uh, Innovation Nation, you're on that with Mo Rocca and some other great folks. Uh, you did, did I mention invention? And I know you as a fantastic human and a really loving dog parent. Uh, oh. So I want you to describe yourself. <laughs> um, see, we're, we're turning it around. So describe yourself and, and, and what ah. you do to people who may be listening to this who don't know you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, well, number one, Thank you for having me on. This is very exciting to me. You were my first guest ever on Ologies. So I guess I'm a science communicator, but I sort of live at this intersection of art and science. I studied film in college and science as well, and I was really torn between the two fields. And so I didn't know way down the line that this could be a job of making making something entertaining out of science. And so I work in TV and on for Netflix and do some shows for them as well as CBS. And then I started my own podcast about five years ago and I didn't expect it necessarily to, I hoped that it would take off, but, um, but I really wanted to do something that was in my voice that was talking about science in a way that I felt like I didn't get a chance to do on TV, especially Saturday morning and kids TV. And so, um, Ologies was born then. And you were my very first guest. It was of all the ologies, I had to start with Volcanology. It's so thrilling and exciting. And you were perfect <sighs> as a first guest. And that is still one of the most listened to episodes well, ever. People started. Well, hopefully this kicks off uh, this is science with a bang here. <laughs> um, not the volcanic type of bang. Uh, we, we'd like to keep those at the minimum. But uh, so I, when I was looking at your your background and your bio, obviously I've known you for several years now. And you know, digging into it, there were things in there. Thank you, Wikipedia, that I was unfamiliar with. Uh, one of which, just as a, a lighthearted thing before we get into more science talk, is please explain the McNuggetini. Oh, I'm always really afraid that when I die, this will make it to my obit. Um, and I hope it doesn't. But uh, I made a, a drink out of a milkshake and a McNugget years ago. And back when the internet was just a, a little tiny baby, it went a little bit viral and then ended up making cocktail videos for Cooking Channel. And I had been a journalist at the LA Times and the LA Weekly. And I covered the arts beat and I covered everything from events at the Science Museum to like a Tetris competition under a bridge. And so I was sort of like on the nightlife beat anyway. So yeah, I made up this drink. It went a little bit viral and then parlayed it into cooking channel videos. But I, everyone was always so envious of the job. Like you get to travel around the country and eat cupcakes and make drinks. But it never really felt like me. And I always... I always felt like such a jerk because I was like, this is great, but I really want to be talking about cockroaches. <laughs> so I ended up volunteering at the Natural History Museum and that kind of changed my life. But it's good to find out that not not everyone's job is their dream job. You know, like not every job can be everyone's dream job. Some people's dream job would be talking about cockroaches, mine. Others would be eating cupcakes in Cincinnati. So it's really, you really got to figure out what you love in life to... <laughs> So that makes me it. wonder if there is someone who's studying like the effects of feeding cupcakes to cockroaches in Cincinnati's microclimate. I'm sure. I'm sure it's someone's PhD. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's yep. absolutely got to be. Well, you know, cockroaches. Uh, well, one particular species makes a milk, feeds their young <laughs> this milk, and it has protein crystals in it. They're one of like the best, most complete meals ever. And uh, scientists are trying to synthesize that to make cockroaches. So milk, that makes so. me think that all of this and all of the, the sheer quantity of random scientific knowledge that you have accrued over conducting all of these <laughs> interviews with all of these ologists, I mean, scientists who study 
everything from cockroaches to, I'm assuming, you know, tsunamis. Um, you are probably terrifying at trivia mm -hmm. nights and dinner parties. <laughs> I mean, in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> Both of those things. Yeah. Um, Both of those things. Yes. It's the trivia in my brain. It's really, really hard not to have thoughts ping pong around a lot because there's always an association. Yes. Always. Yes. With something. Um, I did a show at a, I did a show at UCB this past week where a, they brought me on stage and just had the audience yell out species of bugs. And I just had to just riff with some facts about each of them. And it was a dream to me because it was so exciting to be like, oh, someone mentioned a roly poly. I can tell them that they're isopods and they're land crustaceans. Like where else do I have a captive audience? So I mean, I, I have it. to say bugs aren't my strong suit. So I'm glad I know who to call. I mean, the closest I've gotten to deal with mm -hmm. bugs in like a field research setting was I came across a bunch of blister beetles in a mating frenzy while I was out in the Mojave Desert. And you do Whoa. not want to interrupt this. <laughs> so um, so before we get, we don't want to go <laughs> R-rated the first episode, but it was it was a good time for bug people. Oh, we'll put it that way. Um, but <laughs> this makes me want to ask you, um, because we're obviously talking about something that is, it's scientific E, uh, and it's funny, and it's cool. Um, so from what you have learned from all of your different forays into mass media and communication, um, why do you think that science today doesn't come across as accessible to the average person, whatever that might be, if there even is an average person, really? Right. You know, the biggest part of that for me in terms of being a science communicator is, is context and relatability. And I think people, if they can see themselves, if they can see their life in anything, they will become interested. And I think that there are reality shows that don't have anything to do with our lives. People who drive Rolls Royces that uh, live in giant McMansions, that they don't have lives like ours. But for some reason, people are drawn to it because they're looking for something that looks like their life, relationship troubles or whatever. And I think um, that when it comes to science communication, if you can let people know that there is context and that it somehow relates to their life, whether it changes what they see when they walk their dog, whether they realize what that tree is in their backyard, whether they um, understand more about a ladybug, then it changes the way that they interact with the world. And so I think giving people context and making it feel like it's part of their life is is the biggest challenge in science communication. And also it's just academia is by nature exclusive and I, my family was not there. No one in my family is an academic. I didn't. I didn't know what tenure was when, when I ask people about it. They're like, "Oh, I got tenure," and I'm like, "I don't know what that means." It sounds like they've um, been there for ten years. And so yeah, so I think trying to break. It, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. That it, I thought it came after ten years, and I was like, I remember I talked to someone who said that she worked in a lab that had the same last name as she did, and I said, "Oh wow, is that just a coincidence, or did you have a?" Uh, someone older in your family that you inherited from, she's like, oh, you get to name your lab <laughs> after yourself. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> yep. So I myself kind of um, approach it as an everyday person because I'm I'm not in academia. But um, but yeah, making taking it from those really long titled papers that are in journals behind paywalls to this is what it means for your life and this is what it, you know, this is how snails snail courtship <laughs> works uh reminds you a little bit of your own life doesn't oh, it always you know? i mean that's i i don't do so anything yeah, without thinking yeah. about my moving my shell on my back you know especially not courtship that's essential for courtship <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, but so that you you just made me so i try to i try to make it oh relatable. yeah yeah and then that that actually because you're the person i think who i can you know out the top of my head has talked to the widest array of scientists uh, of anybody i know i mean in my life you know i talk to primarily geoscientists you know i don't oftentimes run into like lab microbiologists unless they're doing something that you know in, involves an organism and a rock <laughs> so for you specifically um mm -hmm. If you had to hazard a, a hypothesis, let's make it very scientific, why do you think that more scientists aren't activists currently? 
Oh, that's a great question. I think that there's something about academia that almost encourages everyone to be in a control group of their own. You know, I think that academia seems to want to polish off a lot of what makes individuals unique in, and in a way that almost is a, looks like a safety from bias. I think that activism is maybe scary for some academics because the fear of, of seeming biased, but I, I'm really not sure. I mean, I think that, sorry, we have a siren. It's, it's okay. People um, can deal with it. It's the real world. <laughs> I'll let it go by. I know. Okay, good. Um, it's the real world. But yeah, I think that I think that from what I understand, a lot of the academics I talk to at least seem really afraid to put their whole self forward, whether it's their own identities, uh, whether it's their background and experience. But I've found and what I think a lot of scientists believe is the questions that you're asking really can steer science in new directions. And so it always feels like to me, if you don't see someone who looks like you in the room, then you belong there even more because you're asking questions that haven't been asked before. But it seems like a lot of scientists, especially in a really, really contentious political mm -hmm. environment, um, are afraid of of seeming like they're coming into their science with biases instead of being persuaded by the science toward a conviction, you know? So it seems very prickly and really hard and even with ologies, I try to keep things, I try to let the information speak for itself and try to convince people maybe who otherwise wouldn't realize that they had an open mind, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And I think you're so right. It's, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> it's um, it's a weird intersection that we are currently at with uh, with science and pop culture and activism and political awakenings, and so, and of course, we have all this with the backdrop of of climate change and other you know big picture things that we have to. They're challenges. They're problems we've got to solve. So, um, so then I would say. I mean, right. you have obviously been doing science communication for many years now, um, but we've not heard that term for that long, science communication or science communicator as like a job description. So in from your perspective, why do you think mm -hmm. there has been such a like a an push towards better science communication? And and why do you think so many young scientists or people who are like science adjacent are really trying to get into science communication? You know, I think the biggest thing that changed the climate, if you will, um, was really flat earthers. I think once once the flat earthers came out, I think a lot of people were like, all right, that's it. I'm becoming a science communicator. <laughs> like, yeah. what happened? Oh. What happened? And so I feel like I feel like there was this just wave of of misinformation. I don't know, maybe around 2016 mm. or so. And I think, um, I think that even the Me Too movement as well, I think inspired a lot of people to say that's enough. My, I have a place at this table. I'm, I'm climbing on whatever soapbox I can cobble together because that's this is enough, you know. And so I think that it was born out of a lot of frustration <laughs> and also just desperation. I mean, I think that it's it's so odd to see whole swaths of populations at odds with hard data um like we've seen in the in the in climate science and you know i had i had a really great interview with a phenologist which phenology is the study of seasonal oh, change cool. and i always ask people yeah it's a great it's everything from leaves changing to spring blossoms to climate change and how that intersects and uh and Libby uh, Elwood, she's amazing. She's at the La Brea Tar Pits, but she um, was talking about, the, I asked her the hardest thing about her job and she started crying. And she was like, I'm so embarrassed I'm doing this. And I was like, let it flow, dude. And she was saying that it's so weird to be a climate scientist who is trying to tell people what's going on and people don't believe her. And so I think a lot of people said, hey, 
like media is so democratized these days. You can have a TikTok get seen by more people than the evening news. Get up there and tell some truths, you know, which is great. It's a great intersection of anger and resentment <laughs> plus media accessibility. Yeah. There you go. That's all you need. That's like the, that's, that's the we are furious and we have uh, cell phone cameras. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, uh, yeah. you know, welcome to the 21st century, right? Um, so basically, like, that, that right. makes really, that right. makes a lot of sense. And I think you mentioned something there, you're talking about our poor phonologist friend. I mean, it is, it is absolutely frustrating. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. flat earthers. I'm a geologist. I, I, anytime anyone says, oh, yeah, there's, you know, thousands of flat earthers <laughs> around the globe. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's just... Ah. Cannot, can't, cannot <laughs> handle it. And I mean, I don't know if you've had this, maybe you're lucky, but I've had people in my own family who are very, um, very, let's say, not even skeptical of modern science, but out and out hostile towards it. I've had it happen. Um, and, you know, people mm -hmm. I care about, even if they're not yep. family members, but it's something that we, if we see, it's pretty pervasive. And um, that's why I wanted to talk to you because mm -hmm. you've done so much work in platforming people and scientific disciplines that maybe haven't gotten the attention because they're not, oh, look, we shot something into space. It's more like, you know, check out this fungus. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I think that's the thing is, you know, talking about that phenologist uh, who got emotional is I feel like there is a lot at stake. And there is a lot of emotion even in science denying. And I try to approach the communication of it with some kind of empathy because I have family members, because I have people in my life, because I have people in my mentions who are really on a different side of a political spectrum that sort of adheres to this um, this deep skepticism about data. Uh, you know, I try to appeal to what is driving them. Is it a fear of is it a fear of, of facing the truth about what maybe like climate science means for their future generations? Is it a fear of being taken advantage of? Is it a fear of being lied to? Is it a fear that if you embrace certain parts of science that are scarier, that that means that they'll come true? So even with audiences and with family members that um, do have some hostility toward it. I try to think about what the fear is behind that and appeal to that and try to approach it a little bit more emotionally when it comes to storytelling. Yeah, you know, I think that's it. I think, uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm of the philosophy and it sounds like, I mean, because you have the background in, in humanities and arts as well as science. I mean, you probably are on the same wavelength as I am in that um, we need everybody on deck to to solve the problems that science can help us solve. Like you can't have people sitting it out. And so it is important mm -hmm. to reach people who may not be like, oh yeah, I'm totally into science. Like we need to reach the the poets and then the artists and the historians. I mean, we need everybody. Um, and so that makes me, um, we want to go in a slightly more uplifting direction now. So I want to know when you think science is at its best. Oh, you know, I love the stories that I hear from ologists who talk about when they realize that they are the only person on earth to know something, when they've made a discovery of a new millipede or when they have isolated a, a compound or when they've realized that a particular microbe isn't extinct and they realize that they're the first person on the planet to really capture that information and be able to spread it. That is such a beautiful moment to hear about. And I I also love when sci I feel like science is at its best when it's powered by passion and when it's fueled by a sense of something bigger. And I, I feel like the best scientists I talk to are the ones who love what they do and they love their subject. And so there are a lot of people who love animals. So they went to the vet school route realized they did not want to be a vet. They wanted to study gopher tortoises in the wild. And that's great. And you're going to be better at what you do if you find out what you love. So I think that there's so much passion in science. And when people click into what they are really, really interested in using the science for to impact the world, like their science gets better and their science communication gets better. So it really comes down to what what would you want to do? I mean, look at you and volcanoes. Like, 
You love oh. volcanoes. There are some people who'd be yeah. like, that is the last place on earth I would yeah, want to be. But I can't fathom. I can't you fathom are that. Climbing into caldera. <laughs> it's the best thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I it's amazing. Yeah. Terrify. It would terrify some people. Yeah. And some people like football sized <laughs> lava bombs. I mean, those are the small ones. <laughs> Cece, you know this. You know me. You know my personal brand of insanity. And it is very much, um, I think that's what makes good scientists yeah. is people who allow their their passion for something or their curiosity to really lead the conversation. And I mean, what I wanted to ask, because mm-hmm. you've done so much um, different sort of SCICOM work, uh, SCICOM for people in the know, um, science communication, um, I obviously I've seen video of you eating um, like a fire retardant gel. <laughs> I have, you know, I know, I know you've done some pretty wild things. Um, and, and I wanted to know out of all, you know, the, the broad sum of your experiences, what is just, it doesn't have to be the most awe inspiring thing, but something that you found really like jaw dropping and amazing that you can share with us. And that it really, every time you think about it, you just get happy or excited or you light up or you're just in awe. Oh, the, the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life happened in Las Vegas, which most people could not say. <laughs> Normally, when I go to Vegas, I don't expect to see anything this I mean, it can be, but not in a good I was there to shoot an episode. That's what I was saying. You go to Vegas and it changes your life, but it's not basically that you're scarred for life. <laughs> so, okay. I, I'm excited. Okay, do tell. <laughs> I, I, have, I have seen some things in Vegas that I I've thankfully probably have, re- have forgotten. But I was there on assignment shooting for CBS for Innovation Nation with uh, my producer, John Murphy. Uh, who has a great podcast now, by the way, um, called Across the Dinerverse. He goes around to different diners and talks to people over hash browns. And and so he's become a podcaster. But um, but yeah, but John Murphy is my my producer for that particular shot. And it was a last minute thing. The other correspondent couldn't make it. So last minute, can I come to Vegas to shoot this? I said, sure. And it was a jetpack. It was a hoverboard powered by small jet engines. Frankie Zapata is a French aeronautics engineer and I suppose daredevil. He has a hoverboard that has two like oatmeal canister sized jets. They are fueled by through tubes to a backpack filled with five gallons of kerosene. Oh my God. (laughs) The man gets on a platform. He fires this thing up and immediately there's some sort of like infrasonic rumble that is like stands all the hairs up on the back of your neck like a tiger roar like you it's a rumble that you can't even from a jet engine nearby that you just can't even comprehend the heat starts blasting and then before you know it frankie zapata has pressed a button and has shot 100 miles an hour hundreds of feet in the air and here's a human being on a hoverboard powered by jetpacks you're in a just a blaze of hot air and so many carcinogens and i have never seen anything like it i couldn't believe i was watching a human being flying around a lake in las vegas and just hundreds of miles an hour in every direction zooming around and it just was like cgi and i was so glad that the other correspondent couldn't make it to that because i was like this is the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life but when he came back down, I got to interview him and I asked Frankie, I was like, did you have health insurance? <laughs> What's, what happens? He was like, no, no, no one, no one will insure me for health, health insurance. And I was like, oh, no, be careful. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was one of the inventions that I, I've gotten to see. But I also really love, I go to the invention convention and I interview kids there for, did I mention invention? And uh the, all these little kids at a science fair who have made these really dope inventions and they're so altruistic. It's like, well, our chicken got eaten by a mountain lion. And so I came up with, a, they, I found out that they're afraid of donkeys. So I came up with a horn that makes a donkey sound and just, oh you know, God. other things. Like I came up with a, a pill robot to remind my grandpa to take his Alzheimer's medication. And you're like, oh, that's so cool. I came up with a device to help my friend. I know like a friend who's nonverbal communicate to class. It's just like 
So I, I love the big ones. And the so small you're ones. basically telling me that, so it's like my favorite thing, which is basically curiosity. And these people have curiosity and then you combine mm-hmm. it with the best instincts of human nature, which is helping each other. And then you get amazing scientific discoveries and sometimes mm-hmm. jetpacks, which sounds pretty excellent. Sometimes <laughs> jetpacks. Yeah. And so <laughs> it was unlike anything. I mean, I've now I want to go get a jetpack. So you you have inspired me when you're retelling to go find a jetpack or just to build one because, you know, why not, right? DIY. Uh, <laughs> should call this Frankie guy up and say, how do I do this? Yeah, and, what yeah, and how do I do this and not die? Um, <laughs> that's always the question in science. Um, <laughs> go to Home Depot. Yep. Yeah, how do I do this and not die? Just please don't tell your health insurance I know, right? company. Like, no, no, I'm um, I'm working on my car. <laughs> it's just a Jetsons level car. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I like to do, um, and I know this is the first <laughs> podcast, so I really appreciate you coming on and being the first guest. Um, but I, the, one of the things that cracks me up about being with the Union of Concerned Scientists is that the name. I mean, we are very very concerned as scientists. We all have to be. It's sort of in the Mm -hmm. job description. So I'd like to ask you to do our very first answer to the question, why are you concerned about science? Oh, oh, that's a great question. I think I am concerned about science because distrust sells and the intersection of media and science, I think, is a little bit of the problem. And I came from a, a line of journalists and very aware of the, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And if you can spark controversy and if you can pit people against each other, you're going to get more clicks and you're going to get more money. And so I think I'm concerned about science because I see it in a tug of war with media, which is kind of at this point um really run run by money and so i think science versus money is always a little scary and i'm concerned that we'll give up i'm concerned that we'll get to a point where we're convinced that things are unchangeable and we'll give up and so you know i think that i i I'm a little concerned that we won't be able to collectively flex a muscle to stop maybe corporate greed from making decisions that are not in the best interest of humanity and the animals on the planet. That is, oh yeah, all of it, all of it. And that is extremely well put. And that's actually why I wanted to have you on first, because I know that you understand the power of communication, both for, for good and for our detriment. So I really appreciate you taking this time. Mm-hmm. And I want everybody listening, if if you haven't already like subscribed to Allie's podcast ologies and you're not already stalking her on all forms of social media, benign stalking, no creepy stalking, um, please do that. Follow Allie <laughs> and uh, support her and her media and SciComm efforts so that we can continue to bring people into the, the age of wonder, whether it's at Jetpacks or Phenology. Uh, and and uh, Keep spreading the good mm-hmm. word of science, Allie. Uh, we love you for it. And thank you for, for joining us. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Bye.